Hello, everyone. Welcome to Lesson 2 in History 3932. And today we're going to do something called the Origins of War Debates. Obviously, this is not going to be comprehensive. It's not going to be uh, in extraordinary depth or detail. This is just to kind of situate you um, in the debates over where war comes from. Wayne Lee does a really, really, really good job in Chapter 1 uh, making the outlines of this debate clear. Um, you will, may also pick up from that first chapter that he's not particularly um, on the side of the anthropologists who like to say that war only comes around with, uh, with civilization, with the invention of the state, and so on and so forth. Um, it's another reason I picked the textbook, because cards on the table, I don't put much stock in a lot of anthropological work um, that argues that, um, because it's wrong. But there are a number of nuances that you could, uh, that you can put into it, and which have been made, put into this argument. Um, and it's not as simple a matter of saying, well, it's part of the human condition, moving on. Uh, obviously it's more than that. Um, is it, does it come about because it's in, is it ingrained behavior? Is it a propensity? Is it aggression? Uh, is it, uh, changes in social structures? There's all kinds of arguments about this, but one point which has generally been accepted now, uh, is that, um, is that uh, war is not a recent invention in human existence. That one has been pretty decisively uh, refuted. Um, and I'm going to give you some, go through some stuff here, and we're going to do some background on uh, some of the uh, books and studies referenced um, in Wayne Lee's chapter, and also in the reading I gave you on perusal, which is Azar Gatz. 2015 article surveying the debates in which he particularly um, criticizes the work of uh, Brian Ferguson and Douglas Fry, who are you know, two of the biggest anthropolog anthropology uh, proponents of, uh, of a, a civilizational uh, or, or state-oriented uh, view of the origins of warfare. I mean, maybe not the state. That's probably it's probably being too strong. But anyway, um, I start here with a quote by Margaret Mead. Gat singles this out as being one of the classic mistakes, which has gone on to influence uh, uh, gener several generations of scholars at this point. Uh, this is her essay in 1940, um, and it's one of those things where where almost everything about it is either wrong or if an aspect of it is correct, we are pretty sure now because of decades more research that it's, it's, it's not correct for the right reason and therefore it gets built into arguments, which, you know, at the, ultimately can influence uh, the way whole societies are taught, the way policy is taught, the way statecraft and diplomacy are taught. Um, but this is one of those classic essays and titles of essays which went on to have quite a, as it turns out, um, negative influence on our understanding of war. Um, and I just realized I didn't bring this down. So let's uh, bring that up. There we go. Um, okay. So... Um, the basic debate falls into three sides and three three versions, if you will. There's a Hobbesian view, Thomas Hobbes, Leviathan. There's the Thomas Hobbes uh, version. This is Leviathan. Uh, this is basically that humans, uh, ever since the fall and the expulsion from the Garden of Eden, because um, he's right, he's writing this in the 1600s, have been. Uh, fighting with each other, war is the human condition because the human condition is fallen and sinful. Um, and from this, I mean, this is a real gross simplification of Hobbes' argument, which is actually much more sophisticated than people give it credit for. This is why we need the state. This is why we need organized society, because otherwise we'd just be, people would just be killing each other. As it turns out, Hobbes was 
probably more correct in that than he realized at the time. The other side to this, of course, is Rousseau. This is the noble savage uh, uh, argument. Um, and if you're thinking, well, this is all very European-based. I mean, these are Europeans looking out at the world, including their own. I will say particularly Hobbes. He's looking around at, at European society uh, as well as outside of it. Um, and they're looking around and saying, well, um, what, how, how do people who are not us uh, experience war? Rousseau uh, basically says, well, this, these, you know, these people are peaceful. It's, it's contact with our civilization that is corrupted. Somehow they have been corrupted. And then the third side um, is that war is intermittent. This is sort of what we're going to see sort of later in this presentation and toward the end sort of the anthropologists trying to reassemble what um, uh, what got recalls a sort of a quasi Rousseauian uh, position. Well, it's intermittent. It's not constant. In fact, it might have completely disappeared um, at various points in human history and then it reemerges. So this, the state is the bad guy again. Um, it's not natural. It's acquired and learned and um, it could be the state, uh, it could be organized hunting, that's a more uh, recent, when I say recent, I mean within 10 years, argument. Um, the patriarchal family, that's uh, kind of the argument of a runaway bestseller from uh, 2021. Uh, or the emergence of advanced cognitive abilities, that's an interesting take from a book from 2018, uh, which then by implication means that war organized cooperative violence has been around much longer than we uh, certainly people in anthropology would like to uh, say it has been. Um, and I start off here with a couple random books uh, that I have that talk about the function of war and war in human history and war and civilization. You know, Ian Morris, who's a classicist out at Stanford, uh, writes this book in 2014 saying war actually uh, has uh, led to progress, that it's par it's a paradox, but um, it's led to less killing over time. It's an interesting argument. It's kind of a political science-y bestseller type argument. Um, uh, Bonadonna's Soldiers and Civilization, which is a very thoughtful book, um, focused primarily on the modern world, but you know, going back to Sparta and Athens and so on. Um, so what you'll often see, and this this is something uh, that you'll see as a as a, a kind of a, a staple of um, military practitioners, practical practicing uh, 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 officers and soldiers. Um, this is you know the sort of thing that you'll read, like you know scholars. Practitioners, Bonadonna was a longtime veteran of the Marine, Marine Corps, Marine Corps Reserve. Um, he, what do they have to say about the role of war in human society and civilization? The origins of war debate is not exactly this. Um, in fact, these books don't really touch on this particularly. Um, and, but I bring them up by way of saying to you, this is not exactly... This is what you might think of in terms of, well, the impact of war and the role of war in human history, and books like this may come to mind. This isn't exactly the debate uh, and the discussion that Lee is having in Chapter 1 or Gott is doing in your, in your perusal article. So here's a, a quick uh, survey of the books excuse me, that uh, Gott actually discusses. Um, uh, Wayne Lee discusses this as well. Uh, some of them, particularly at Lawrence Keeley, War Before Civilization, and of course they're arranged in chronological order. Um, Keeley, 1997, War Before Civilization. This is saying, uh, this is kind of the death knell of the Rousseauian position that no, actually, pre civilization uh, societies were very violent. Um, you have uh, Kelly. 2000, who's arguing, okay, sure, but we can salvage something from the Rousseauian position. Um, 
War in the Tribal Zone, this uh, Ferguson 2000, which is tr- arguing, got, discusses this uh, quite extensively. Um, uh, and basically arguing for the, for the, the, as the tribal societies are impacted by um, running into uh, social, advanced, socially complex, state-oriented societies, they begin to adopt uh, these, uh, the, the warlike practices of the state societies. Uh, Otterbein, 2004, basically argues for two kinds of war. There's war that happened pre-state, and there's war that happened post-state, and all our pro- the problems in modern society are from post-state war. So one begins hundreds of thousands of years ago, the other begins only about 4,000 years ago at the rise of state. So you're starting to, in the aftermath of Keeley's book, you're starting to see people, anthropologists, try to, to put something back together here. And of course, Douglas Fry, 2007, Beyond War, arguing that, well, look, for 99% of human history, um, there has really been little little to no war. Um, so, and where was, where was I in this? Yes. Um, there's little, there's little to no war, nomadic hunter-gatherer existence, um, you know, war is actually rare in hunter-gatherer uh, society. And you may notice in Gatt's article, 2015 article, um, he goes after Fry a lot. Um, and But we'll come back to Fry um, because it ties into a, uh, a volume which uh, was actually was kind of a, a bestseller and was, was touted on the New York Times and elsewhere. Um, Okay, so these are sort of five of the books that um, Gat and, to a lesser extent, uh, Lee mention. Um, obviously, um, as our Gat warned civilization, this is kind of the the uh, be all end all study. Um, and I said two thousand six in. I think that was, I'd like to say, was it 2006? Did I, or am I just type that? No, it was 2008. I don't know why I said 2006. Um, let's, uh, actually, let's do this. Let's fix that right now. I don't know why. I, I knew it was 2008. Um, okay, there we go. All right, so um, this book's over 800 pages long. Uh, I've provided you with a couple uh, chapters, um, but there it's heavy going. He writes with clarity, but it's it's heavy. It's heavy going. Uh, Gatt's professor at Tel Aviv University. Um, he's probably one of the most interesting and original thinkers in in military histories or study of warfare. Um, not as well known as he should be. Um, so he writes this in two thousand eight. And this, you could say, is probably the next book after Keeley to really argue more for the kind of a Thomas, not a, kind of a Thomas Hobbesian perspective that look, people have been violent to each other in organized ways going back a long time. And you can't just point to the rise of the state in Mesopotamia and then say, oh, there we go. That Now if we could just deconstruct this model of human civilization for the past 4,000 years, we would get rid of war. Gott's not buying that. Um, um, I put uh, one of the classic world military history textbooks here, Volume 1. I like this book a lot. Um, you should put that on the table. Um, Steve Marillo, Jeremy Black, Paul Lococo. Um it's uh, the first chapter is very, uh, very much a Rousseauian uh, uh, perspective, um, and in fact, I have had at other times to to uh, you know put uh, put Keeley and Gat into the discussion, especially when I've been teaching this with graduate students, um, because you know the the standard thing that the authors of this textbook, which you. Know, after Wayne Lee's book is probably the most popular world history, military history textbook, the, the vision they put forward 
is one that's very much in line with the sort of Fry and Ferguson school. Um, however, the grand, the grand book that had everyone talking in 2021 is probably this one. And if you follow this kind of thing, uh, you probably have heard of it. The, the Dawn of Everything, Graeber and Wengro. Full disclosure, uh, I am not a fan of this book. Um, I know relatively few historians who are. It's more or less um, Graeber, the late David Graeber was a very famous anthropologist. The um, David Wengro is a very well-respected archaeologist. Um, he's still alive. Um, and they are putting forward essentially a plea, an anarchist plea, and they're very open about that, um, to reimagine uh, human history. So they're uh, very open about the goal of the book. They want to show that uh, human history and human society is not fixed on the path it has taken. It's the product of choices. We could make different choices because the last 10, 15, 20 years of archaeology have shown us that um, in point of fact, um, uh, everything we thought we knew about human history was wrong. Um, and they give relatively little attention to the rise of warfare, but what they, uh, what they do, uh, what they do discuss generally follows the anthropological models. They go deep in with, uh, fall in deep with Norbert Fry, um, and they rely very heavily on his book on, uh, his edited volume from 2013, which I'll show you in a moment. Um, ironically, in one interesting sense, they actually come close, very close to arguing for a variation of the classic uh, feminist uh, study of uh, the origin of patriarchy. This is uh, Gerda Lerner's 1987 legendary volume, in that by the end of the book, um, um, Graeber and Wengro are arguing that really the origin of war most likely comes from the loss of freedoms within uh, within societies and then people can be put against each other and ultimately this probably comes down to um, the rise of the the family unit and the the in patriarchal authority um, so in essence their argument there is not particularly um, not particularly new um, and has to be taken with all the caveats that Wayne Lee and Azar got have marshaled. And if you read the footnotes to their articles, it's not just them. Um, and Graeber and Wengro also rely very much on this book, um, which is quite a, an interesting uh, collection of essays. Um, Ferguson uh, tries to reestablish um, the, the, the contact zone theory uh, in this tribal zone theory um and this is this features prominently in the dawn of everything i mean missing from the dawn of anything is anything by azar got um as well as some of the most more interesting recent discussions which would seriously complicate that book uh and i mentioned again i'm going on about the dawn of everything because it was an extremely prominent book uh i don't like it at all and it's and it's one of those books that because it's getting this attention and because it's very wrong on many ways, and an awful lot of historians will, would tell you that, um, it needs to be addressed. Um, so in 2012-2013, uh, um, so right around the time that you know this book came out, you have uh, Augustine Fuentes, uh, Humans Are Not Naturally Aggressive, um, this idea that somehow war is a quote-unquote natural thing, I'll put that out of your mind, that's another lie, uh, and we don't have to worry about it, uh, about about that, because humans are not naturally aggressive, humans are naturally peaceful, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Pickering, who has a very interesting take on where um, warfare comes from, that this actually comes from organized hunting, um, and that when... Uh, sort of big game dies out, so too does uh, warfare, and then it kind of reemerges uh, again. Um, however, the the most interesting work 
um, around that same time, and then here as recently as 2018, um, and again, things which are uh, missing from uh, from The Dawn of Everything, from Graeber and Wengro's book, are books like Chacon and Mendoza, North American Indigenous Warfare. This was a huge intervention uh, into this debate in 2013 by basically saying, no, actually, indigenous American societies were had you know, lots were quite warlike, um, and this is pretty conclusively demonstrated from uh, from a range of disciplines, archaeology in particular, um, and that the idea of uh, indigenous Americans not being warlike is itself a form a uh, vestige of of colonialism, uh, which I thought was a, I think is a very interesting argument. Um, Shara and Verano, Embattled Bodies and Battled Spaces, War in Pre-Columbian Mesoamerica and the Andes. Spectacularly good book. A lot of archaeology, again, kind, pretty much putting to rest the idea that um, warfare, say, in Mesoamerica was ceremonial, which is something Graeber and Wengro and the Dawn of Everything really buy into. It's a very anthropological thing. Well, it's an extension of play. It's an, all, it's an extension of ceremony. It's a homo ludens. Um, to use a to use an old phrase, um, these two volumes basically put an end to that, um, and of course, naturally, they're missing from the dawn of everything. And then more recently, uh, Kim and Kissel's Emergent Warfare and Our Evolutionary Past. This is a very interesting one in which they're they're threading a different sort of needle and saying and ar- trying to argue. And again, all everything I'm saying here about all these books, I'm taking books of hundreds, sometimes many hundreds of pages, and reducing them to a few sentences. Um, but one of the core things that they argue is that war becomes possible. And again, by war, they're they're talking about organized cooperative human violence. Um, It becomes possible once cognitive abilities, humans develop cognitive abilities um, to actually think in the abstract, to think outside of their own perspectives and to communicate across uh, multiple, uh, uh, multiple removes. Uh, from themselves to entire groups. So in one sense, there's um there's a sort of early sort of proto-linguistics or linguistic element um, being tied back to cognitive abilities that they say then means war is very, very, very ancient. Um, but again, they'll, they're careful, it's qualified, and, and so on and so forth. All right, so... Um, that is pretty much what I have for you here. These are some of the books that are um, being discussed uh, in Gat, and some of them are even referenced in Lee's chapter. Um, but it gives you, I think, a, a, a bit of a sense of the depth and complexity of these questions. Um, odds are you will find that you like or you find convincing one or two elements of Gat and maybe a couple of elements of Fry, or maybe there's an essay if you go and acquire um, Fry's 2013 edited volume. There's one of those essays that really grabs you and you think that's it right there. I think to me that's the key thing. Um, and you'll find often that that's what scholars do. Um, they they pick and choose um and so, although we tend to describe uh, debates like the origins of war as being, you know, one, two, or three camps, in reality, most people, if you are talking to them over, um, over a, a, well, let's say over a beer, because you know, especially, well, especially historians, it'll be over a beer. Um, they'll say, you know, I like this over. Here. I, I'm not convinced by this part of it. Um, so that's the background uh, to these debates on the origins of war, and uh, happy reading and commenting.